Okay, so we are going to start uh, our discussion of rocks now. And as you guys talked about a little in lecture, there's kind of a hierarchy of how things are structured to get to the point where we're talking about rocks. So um, that kind of goes back to the chemistry where you're looking at atoms and elements, and then those elements can come together to create minerals, and then <clears throat> your minerals will come together and create rocks. And that's where we're at here. And it says very clearly on this slide that um, most rocks are composed of many minerals. So typically when you're just walking down the street and you kick a rock or stub your toe on one, um, that's going to contain a whole bunch of different minerals within it. Um, and basically, uh, kind of the connection with minerals, all the mineral samples that you can find in the world, like some of the ones you saw um, in last week's materials or in the lab test itself on minerals, those are all rocks too. It's just they happen to be only one mineral made, you know, they're pure and only one thing in one sample. Uh, so those can still come together in various processes to create um, rocks. But uh, for, for those one, that's the difference between what we looked at last week and what we're looking at this week. Everything that we look at this week is going to be composed of more than one mineral. Um, and how do we basically divide out? I mean, the rocks are everywhere and there are a lot of them. So we have to come up with a system of classification to kind of uh, keep everything organized and to be able to offer some sort of system to figure out what un an unknown rock might be just by looking at it. And so we look at um, how the rocks actually formed to determine basically which of the big three types they are. And then of course uh, that environment of formation can cause very specific things to happen to a rock as you go too. All right, so next slide. We're going into sedimentary first. I mean, there's no real rhyme or reason to why I chose to do that, but there it is. Um, and these ones um, are a little more, I would say, gentle in their method of formation because it has to do with essentially bits and pieces of stuff that um, come together to form a rock, but uh, it does so in the presence of water. And that's the key, key point here is that water is a vital part of that process. And as that water evaporates, um, the solid left behind is what you would get uh, to and now call a sedimentary rock. Um, so you, you usually need sediments, and those are small bits of rock or organic material. These are also called clasts. Um, clasts are just another fancy word for bits and pieces. Um, and as, as I said, they form, uh, typically we're going to look near um, in the past, ancient bodies of water, large inland seas, under the oceans, things like that, you might get uh, sedimentary rock. All right. So um, key process that happens in uh, the formation of sedimentary rocks as they kind of get their um, themselves going is this process of cementation or cementation, uh, just like you would see a lot of in Texas, lots of cement or cement. Um, that is going to be the critical piece that glues together whatever you're trying to make into a rock. Um, and the key point within all this is that we, we usually are starting in a very wet and saturated environment with lots of water. And what that water does inside the ground or the mud or wherever you, uh, you're trying to form a sedimentary rock is it causes these minerals that we have kind of looked at last week, some of them you can actually dissolve in water, uh, most of them actually uh, over a long period of time. Um, and so when the water evaporates, those dissolved minerals, almost like uh, salt or sugar, uh, you know, when you're trying to stir it into your beverages at home, if you let the liquid evaporate, you're going to be left with a kind of a sludge or crystalline uh, material, and that's the salt or the sugar that's left behind. So that serves, and that's kind of like the metaphor for how you can hold together these sediments within a sedimentary rock. And so those minerals slowly solidify and crystallize and they kind of latch onto the little bits and pieces and that's what you get. Now let's see what happens when I click this. And I'm almost gonna say that it will not allow me to do that. So I'm gonna share a different screen here real quick. I'm gonna stop that one. And we're gonna switch to this one so you can see the process. So essentially, this is how you get a sedimentary rock. I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit for you. So get in there tighter. 
And as we do that, you're here at a beautiful oceanic environment. Maybe it's a shallow inland sea and there's the beach and the sand within and you've got lots of most likely salty water nearby. And I'm just gonna play that animation to let you see what happens. So that in you know five seconds is how you get a sedimentary rock, which is a process that in real life takes perhaps as many as hundreds of years. So let's do that again and I'll slowly talk uh, through it. You have water in between all the little sand grains and then that water evaporates. That putty colored material you get is your mineral cement and that's what holds it all together. So um, when you kind of bust up a sedimentary rock, what you're getting are the little sediments, but a lot of that is gonna be um, solidified pieces of mineral that were once holding it together. Okay, so I will go back to your other show here. And we're back into it. Okay, so um, that kind of sums up how you glue together the um, sediments within the sedimentary rock. And now here's a fun story. Um, if you have organisms that are present in the area where there's lots of water and lots of sediments, um, if that animal dies or maybe it gets trapped under a, a bunch of mud, um, <clears throat> you can actually create what we know of as a fossil. And that is a thing that only happens within sedimentary rock. It is almost impossible to find fossils in any of the other kinds of rock except sedimentary because, again, sedimentary is a fairly gentle process that really only involves evaporation of water and crystallization of minerals. So the funny thing is uh, what happens to, um, I guess, to be morbid, a carcass after it is dead, the soft stuff kind of um, will wash away or rot away or whatever it is. Uh, and the um, harder stuff is what's left behind. So you're talking like bones and fingernails, toenails, teeth, um, scales in some cases uh, in a plant, it might be the harder part, like a, the stem or a needle or something like that. Uh, a lot of sea creatures have shells that'll be left behind as well. But that kind of becomes a part of the sludge, the mineral cement itself, and it can actually be um, hardened or basically turned into a rock over a long, long period of time. And that imprint of the fossil or the actual uh, creature itself can be almost entombed in the rock forever. Um, and so that's what we see a lot of when we dig them up. And so if you see a fossil, you've got an unknown rock in front of you and you're looking at it and you see anything that resembles something that was once alive, like a shellfish, a little, you know, what we see a lot of shell fossils, um, or maybe you see a plant imprint or a bone, that is 100% sedimentary rock. So that's the kind of moral of that story. Um, the other process that kind of really seals the deal here is the compaction process. And that happens a lot in the more standard classic sedimentary rocks like shale. Uh, you will squeeze out um, all the water and kind of in increase the density a little bit and, and create sometimes uh, pretty massive layers of, of sediment. And then the water, once that's gone, you get that um, kind of that stripy layering. And we're talking a lot of these are you know, 10, 20 feet thick, where so you can't really tell that from these pictures, but it's pretty intense. Um, compaction is critical in the process of uh, coal formation as well, and coal is actually considered a sedimentary rock because it is basically once living organisms, plants, and animals that are dead, and it kind of turns into a tar type substance, and over time the water evaporates all out of that, and you get left with this hard um, black kind of um, highly concentrated energy actually within that, but um, substance. And that's it. So the last thing that um, can occur to form a sedimentary rock is what we call chemical action. That's not the last thing, but it's one of the last things. Chemical action is more of a, I think, I consider it more of a boring sedimentary rock because what's happening is you don't really have sediments, but you have pure mineral cement. And uh, that can cause um, a kind of very different look to a rock because if you don't have the bits and pieces in there, it's going to look fairly boring or bland or, or kind of uniform in color. Uh, you may not see too many uh, crystals or whatever, even though we, we are crystallizing minerals, you don't see too many of them. So 
Um, one of the great examples of that is if you've ever been to a true awesome cave uh, anywhere in this country or another country, I'm gonna click that link and then uh, I will switch over to that share. Um, <clears throat> Um, so caves are a great example of how you can get um, pure chemical chemical form sedimentary rock. And so the story is, and I'll tell you a little bit about it before I hit play here. <clears throat> You've got a um, you know an area of the world with uh, you know there's a river running through there. It looks like it's a fairly uh, wet climate where you get rain enough or frequently. Um, <clears throat> and what happens is that, as you can see in this picture, underneath the ground, the water's actually kind of in aquifers and little pools and pockets within that. And what happens is the water will dissolve the minerals within that area. So when I hit play, you're gonna see that happen really quick. It actually eats away at the, the rock or the minerals or the sediments, and it really hollows out these passages. And then for reasons we don't really know why, maybe there's a, a continental plate shift and this is no longer in an area that gets a lot of rain, or maybe there was a cataclysmic um, disaster that caused this area to dry out. Um, so there's there, the water level drops rapidly, but what you're left with are the, the openings within the, um, the rock that the water had actually chiseled out. The thing is though, the water dissolved those minerals and whatever water's left in here or any additional water that comes through from rain is gonna trickle down and create these spikes inside the cave. It's like almost like um, ice crystals that hang off the side of your house in the winter time, if you've ever seen those. It, it, the water just drips and drips and drips and drips, but it does, as it does so, it leaves behind the minerals that were dissolved within it. So the, the uh, spikes actually grow, and this process takes forever, but um, they, they, over you know, thousands and thousands of years, these things can actually get pretty big, um, and that's what we um, see within caves. So that's kind of the process there. But they're all pure chemical rocks. There's these, these spikes that you see are not made up of little bits and pieces. They're just made up of pure mineral that is left behind as the water kind of evaporates away. So it's kind of a very strange process. But uh, it, there, you will notice within there, they're not necessarily the most pretty in color and you don't necessarily see sparkles everywhere. But there are pretty, uh, they're pretty awesome in their own right because they, um, they, they can form such huge uh, spikes. Those are stalactites and stalagmites, if you weren't uh, kind of thinking or kind of remembering what those words were. Okay, so we'll go back over here. Um, and so, yeah, you can see in the pictures on this slide that there are some stalactites there. And they are pretty awesome, they're, but they're not necessarily in their own right, necessarily pretty um, in color. All right, so it says I can't do that. All right. Organic processes is the last one. This is a wild way. Then one of the, to me, the most interesting ways you can actually form a sedimentary rock, but it's again, not made up of bits and pieces. It's actually made up of um, pure mineral cement, again, similar to what we just talked about within caves. And this happens all in the process of life. So if you have uh, shellfish or uh, corals, any kind of marine crustacean type thing, they're actually trying to make their homes as they grow and their homes uh, grow with them in layers like you can see on a clam shell, for example. And as they, um, as they need to grow and expand, the, the organisms are actually sifting or siphoning out, um, I wouldn't want to say siphoning, but they're kind of filtering out um, pure minerals within the water, so salts and calcium and things like that. And they, they actually deposit it and create their own home. And that allows more space for them to grow as an organism and then you know, the cycle of life goes on. And that happens within uh, any kind of, again, creature that seems to need it or create its own home to live in, so shells and corals and things like that. Um, one little thing, kind of an exception here, um, this little guy up here in the corner, I'm gonna switch to the laser pen here. This is actually called coquina, and it's, I know it sounds funny, but C-O-Q-U-I-N-A. And what that is, is um, sometimes, yeah, and you've probably been to a beach where there's a lot of different uh, shells on the beach. And as the uh, eons pass, they get crushed up and, and um, ground down into little pieces. And those can actually, if your environment is right, where there's more water into the system or area, you can actually re-cement those little pieces of shell back into a more uniform looking rock that's basically, it looks like almost like a oatmeal. 
where it's just ground up bits of shell that get stuck back together again. That is called coquina. It's kind of an interesting one. So all of it was formed by organic processes, but um, the process of re, I guess, crystallization of minerals can um, cement those little pieces back together because they're all dissolved mineral in the first place. They became solid. So if you add water back to those pieces, um, they, that, that water can cause more mineral ferment to come back out and uh, glue them all together again. So it's kind of an interesting process. So keep your eye open for that one. Um, so when you're trying to identify these rocks, sedimentary are they, you know, again, with any of these rocks that we're going to try and identify, there's nothing you do to it. There's not actually a test or a procedure that you perform to figure it out unless you want to get really technical. It's all about just look at it and, and use basic um, properties to try and narrow down what you think it might be. So for sedimentary, there it is. You look at the texture you'll, and see if you see little bits and pieces of anything. You see if you uh, are looking at more of a dull uniform color that would be crystalline or if it's a once living type scenario you're going to see bits and pieces of maybe organisms there or a fossil that's bioclastic so those are your three main breakdowns of sedimentary rock then from there you're really just looking at well how big are the bits and pieces and that'll determine what the name of the rock is also you can look at the um, composition in terms of the bioclastic ones is it is it is it all like a dark black material? And then you're probably looking at coal and that's a bioplastic sedimentary rock. Or if it's, um, like I said before, maybe bits and pieces of shells, that's gonna be um, your rock called coquina. So there's a, these are, this is another way you can kind of narrow down which of those it is. And I can tell you 98% of the time when it's bioclastic, it's probably some sort of limestone. Um, so uh, that will show up in our next little chart here, which basically is your cheat sheet to figure out how to identify sedimentary rocks. So if you kind of use what I just showed you and follow along with this chart, literally it kind of goes from left to right. You start with texture and you look at whether it's clastic, crystalline, kind of a hybridized limestone can look very bioclastic or it can look crystalline. It depends on whether you have creatures around. And then you have a good old fashioned coal over there, which is an easy one to pick out. So there's your textures. And then for the clastic ones, these are all on top. Now you make a decision, are, the, are they very big pieces or do they get really small? The, the smallest, smallest ones are clay sized sediments. Those are really, really, really tiny. It's uh, like dust. So if you were ever to throw a lump of clay in water, you can see it turn into like a cloud. That is how small clay sized sediments are. When you cement those together though, you get a rock called shale. And we'll take a look at the, some of the actual rocks in the next video. Uh, a little bit bigger sediments are silt. Those That's kind of like dust in your fingers type stuff. So it's very fine grain, but um, glue it together. You're going to get like a, it's all going to be one color, but you're going to be able to kind of see or feel those, those, that gritty silt within that. And that would be siltstone. Sand is obvious. Uh, if you take beach sand and you cement those grains together, you're going to get something called sandstone. And it feels, funny enough, like sandpaper. So it's pretty straightforward. If they're big pieces, like little pebbles, or, or like if you think uh, you're looking at like gravel sized things that are put together, that is going to be what we call either a conglomerate or breccia. Now, the, the only difference here is conglomerate has more rounded off pieces that have been weathered uh, by um, kind of rolling through streams or whatever first. The angular ones, uh, if they haven't gone through uh, being in water, those little pieces might be very sharp. Uh, usually this happens near um, uh, glaciers and that kind of scenario where the, the sediments don't get a real chance to be uh, worn down by nice warm flowing streams. They just kind of get stuck there. Then the water hits one time and they get stuck together. So they'll be a little bit more sharp. Down at the bottom, the crystalline ones. Um, rock salt is interesting. I think I um, might have showed you a picture of that in our last lab test. Um, it's basically halite that has probably some more impurities built within. So it might not be pure, clear uh, looking halite. It might have some, some grayish or blackish um, pieces of stuff in there that kind of make it a little less pure. But that's actually considered rock salt. And that's uh, a sedimentary rock formed from uh, crystallizing halite um, with other impurities. And it's uh, very useful, as you know, because we need that to melt, um, melt 
as ice and snow and things like that. Also, we can use some of that in water softening and things like that. So uh, gypsum, gypsum, uh, you know, again, pure gypsum is nice and clear and beautiful, but uh, if you kind of have impurities in it or it's not as crystal clear, uh, we still can use it, but it's called rock gypsum. Um, and that's really essentially what's in a lot of your sheetrock walls behind the paper and the paint that you put on it. Uh, Dollar stone is uh, very, very similar to limestone, actually. They're very, very similar, except the chemical composition's a little different. Uh, so you won't see the, necessarily the same color or whatever. However, um, I'm gonna erase some of this ink now because it's getting distracting. Limestone and dollar stone, um, we're going to, I'm just going to kind of make it easy for you. We are not responsible at all for uh, limestone, so, or dollar stone, I'm sorry. So this one, you can almost cross it right off your little chart and just be done with it. Um, gypsum and rock salt, I'm just going to tell you, if you see those, they'll look a lot like your um, pure mineral sample, honestly. So it'll be clear, obviously crystalline. You might even kind of go back and say, wow, there's a, I see little cubic shapes in there, and that would be the halite. Or if you see that fibrous um, uh, sheet-looking thing in the same clearish sample, that would be gypsum. So I'm not going to try and confuse you with all that. Um, the other thing up above, I did talk about breccia just now, and I do love myself some breccia, but unfortunately, um, I don't have very many good pictures of it, and you won't have to worry about it, so you can also cross that one off. And I'm gonna try to get back to the pen of the eraser, so you can cross that one off. So already, we're kind of eliminating a couple of different samples that you won't see, but you know they're still interesting, and they have their own story, but um, these ones are kind of the main ones you'll be left over trying to identify, so there we go. Switches us over to igneous rocks. Uh, you can feel free to pause this for a while and go take a break, but um, I'm just going to get right into it because I can, because I love talking about rocks. Totally a different um, beast in terms of how they're formed. And I told you back at the beginning that if you want to look at how to determine which of the three rock types you're talking about, it, it's all about how they formed. And in this case, like we talked about how sedimentary is kind of an easy, slow, less violent um, kind of formation process, but igneous rocks, it's all violence, uh, which is fun. Um, because really what you need is to start with the stuff you see on the bottom there, which is um, ma magma or lava. Now magma and lava, you hopefully have been talked about that in lecture in the past in your other science classes that magma is down below the earth's surface and lava is at the surface or above. Um, so the deal is, all you have to do is cool that off, and as it does so, it solidifies. It's going to, it's no different, literally, and this is hard for people to believe, but it's no different from taking liquid water in a cup, putting it in the freezer, cooling it down, and it freezes. The only difference is we're not talking about water here. We're talking about literally molten mineral soup. So there's all the minerals we talked about mixed together in a glowing hot liquid, and we're going to cool those babies down. Um, you know, we're not talking about starting at like, you know, 50 degrees and cooling it down to 32 and then below 32. We're talking about thousands of degrees and we've got to cool it down to like normal world air or air temperatures that we live in. And as that happens, that that's when these solidifications start to occur. And you can see it down here that uh, in the lower right, this little spot that I'm circling, that's still liquid hot lava that is doing flowing as lava does, but you can see the skin of uh, the blackish crusty stuff forming on it. That is the first signs that rock is actually beginning to, to form. And once all of it cools down and it's gone uh, in terms of the heat, then it will be a solid rock that you can then walk on. Um, but you would probably wanna wait for a little while because that rock is going to be extremely hot uh, so uh, you don't want to be even even what looks like solid rock. This stuff is still would melt your shoes right off. So you got not. I wouldn't recommend walking near it. All right. So that's a uh, key point, though. Before I move on from this slide, this right here, this word crystallization is huge because as this stuff is cooling down, you're going to see the minerals that are in there start to kind of separate out. So they'll be they'll be. Um, 
chunks of different feldspars and quartzes and things like that that start to create crystals of themselves within that. So that's how you're going to get some of the cool um, textures within an igneous rock. Um, big category of igneous rocks are the intrusive ones. These are the ones that, gonna, that are going to form down below the Earth's surface. And because of that, it's like having a blanket over you. You have all this um, rock and dirt over the top of you and it kind of uh, as even though you're you're talking about melted rock, uh, it takes forever for that stuff to cool down when you have so much kind of insulation over the top of it. The heat can't escape as quick. So you're talking about really slow cooling times. And be, as that um, happens, that allows the mineral crystals, which we talked about during crystallization, they get really, really large. And that causes what we call a very coarse texture. And when we look at some of the... Um, samples together. I will talk about that, but what, what I mean by that is you're going to see big crystals, specific crystals of, uh, like I'm outlining some right now. These are all one big crystal. Uh, there's another one there, and, and so this one right here, this big long black one right there. There's different crystals that are all embedded within these rocks, and the bigger they are, the more coarse the texture it is said to be. Um, so that's that. And they all form an, igne in an igneous intrusion, which is basically a melted um, lava chamber beneath the Earth's surface that eventually, finally, cools off. Um, the other big categories, the extrusive ones, now these are the um, ones that form at or above the Earth's surface. And uh, you can kind of talk about this at dinner with your friends and loved ones if you want. You can say, um, or if you, you know, want to go for a little road trip, you can tell them how you are looking at an igneous extrusion. An igneous extrusion is just a volcano. Um, and that's the eruption of actual magma that now becomes lava as it leaves the Earth's um, interior and moves up to where we live. Uh, because it's up here, though, it's going to cool down really, really fast. Um, why? Because, you know, like I said, it starts at thousands of degrees. And then, you know, when you put it in even 80 degree air temperature, that's a thousand degrees or more cooler and that is going to cause it to rapidly cool and because of that the mineral crystals don't get the, the chance or the opportunity to grow as much as um, we did in intrusive igneous rocks so um, you'll see small crystals on occasion but um, sometimes you won't see any that's what not evident means so um, again there you go uh, also i should take the opportunity uh, a lot of these rocks when they form form into very either glassy textures like you're seeing on this uh, lower left picture or if there's um, gases that are in kind of like you know when you pour a can of soda into a glass you see the bubbles if that's the case with the lava where there's gases in there dissolved and those gases are trying to escape you're going to get these these pockets or bubbles within the rock and that is an uh, both of those are really really obvious giveaways for igneous and extrusive ones at that. Okay, so a couple of, I think I just mentioned this, but the, 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 um, this is said to be a glassy texture when you see that uh, really shiny, um, uh, but you're gonna see it looks very uh, regular. You see these fracture lines, these curved fractures. That's a very ugly way to break something. Um, and it kind of creates a pattern like that. That is a glassy texture though. It, it literally looks like a piece of broken glass. Um, and they can be of different colors. This one happens to be black. Um, fine is where you get for texture. You'll see some small crystals within it. Um, nothing crazy, but they're there. Um, I'm trying to find some in there. Any, any, any of these little pink grains, they're all little mini crystals, but you might see a little black crystal here or there, maybe a silver one on occasion, but they're really small. and. Um, not, nothing like what you would see in something like granite, which has a much more coarse texture. Then again, we talked about um, the vesicular ones are the ones with the little pockets in it or gas holes. The, in this case, there's a big one right there. Anytime you see those little uh, bubble shapes within a rock, that is a dead giveaway. We're talking about an igneous rock that had a very violent and explosive eruption with lots of gases involved in, and they were in, in the lava when it actually shot out of the volcano. And as the bubbles try to escape, they get trapped and you get these little shapes. All right. Um, the last thing we're going to do here before we talk about how to identify an igneous rock is to kind of set some ground rules. Our 
um, when we think of color, a lot of times we think, oh, red or green or blue or um, whatever it might be. Now, in the world of rocks, we have to think in terms of shades of gray, and I don't mean that naughty book that everybody loves, but shades of gray, like, is it a dark, dark gray? Or is it a, like, how, think of it as it would look through a black and white TV from the old days. Would a color like um, pink look light or dark? And I think you agree that probably would look a little lighter on the on the scale the, the scale of shades of gray, like it would be more of a light gray or white color. Uh, whereas purple, for example, purple might be considered a darker tone or shade within the gray family, right? So you kind of got to look at rocks with a uh, with a different kind of lens. You're not necessarily seeing them in full color in terms of you know trying to determine whether it's a light or dark color rock. You got to think in terms of grays, um, the density. Uh, you all don't get to handle these uh, in, in a virtual uh, world, but, you know, the heavier the rock is for its size, the more um, uh, dense it is and the more likely it is to have higher concentrations of heavy metals like iron and zinc and uh, uh, what else, lead, things like that. Uh, versus if it was a lighter for its size rock, you might have less in the way of metal period, but you also may have some more lighter metals like aluminum. Um, so just saying now that I kind of spelled that out, I guess there's a word for that. Mafic is um, the term we use for when the rock is probably going to be more dense for or heavy for its size, more dense. That's because it has things like iron and magnesium and some other heavier metals in it. Whereas the felsic ones are the, the lighter in color, um, or light, they're also lighter in color actually, coincidentally, but they're lighter um, in, for their size and they're gonna have a little, um, a little more in the way of low density metals like aluminum. All right, so there's that. And again, we kind of look at um, making our, our decision as to how to figure out what a name for an igneous rock is in two big, decisions first before you start going any deeper. One is the color. Is it light or dark? In, our, in other words, is it like a shade of gray that would be very light or white? Or is it a kind of a dark uh, tone gray to black? Okay, so that helps you determine the color and I'll show you how that is useful in just a second. Then you're gonna look at your um, textures. So is it very coarse, coarse? That's gonna be your intrusive larger crystals, fine or glassy or vesicular as we talked about, that would be the extrusive one. So let's go to our chart. Now this may look like a mess to you or very complicated, but I promise it's not. Um, it's actually a little easier to read than you think. And when we go and do some of the um, rock identifications together, you, I'll show you how to use the chart. It's pretty easy. Uh, I will say right now, I'm gonna go back and if we were to look at this one down here in the lower, this is actually, well, it's a vesicular basalt actually. Um, looking at it in terms of shades of gray, do you think that's a dark color? Would that show up dark on a black and white TV or would it be very light? And hopefully you're thinking, well, it looks almost dark gray or brown even. Um, so what you would do on the chart is say, all right, color, this is middle of the road right here. So everything this way would be a lighter color and everything this way would be a darker one. So the rock I just showed you would be one of the ones over here because it's clearly a darker rock. Uh, one quick exception, I mean, that's not really an exception because green, dark green on a black and white TV is still gonna look pretty dark. These guys right here are literally green. They have high concentrations of the mineral olivine in them. But these ones right here, all, all of them are going to be really dark gray, um, maybe even um, a dark reddish color in certain cases. But red, again, can look pretty dark um, on a black and white TV. So um, the one we just looked at, if you kind of put two and two together, also it had holes in it or gas pockets. So we're going to take a look at that. But um, it would be over here, um, and you would have to look back, do you see big, huge crystals in it, which would mean coarse or very coarse, or not so many crystals, uh, or very small ones, or was it just glassy? And I know that if you think back 
looking at that, that is not glassy and it's not shiny or, or anything like that. Um, you also don't see huge crystals in it. You actually do see the gas pockets, which um, if you go back to the chart, um, vesicular ones, these vesicular rocks, that, that's any of these ones that I'm shading right now. So it, it, that eliminates all of these and that one. And you're, you're now choosing whether it's scoria or vesicular basalt. Um, and based on the color with that, uh, you can probably say it's vesicular basalt. Um, scoria tends to be on the more reddish side or have a more distinct color. It's not a gray rock necessarily. So uh, it's a little easier to see um, the difference there when you actually have a sample in front of you, but we'll go with it for now. Anyway, that's a quick rundown. We'll go into it again when we identify more rock samples together later. Okay, so moving on, that brings us to metamorphic, and this is quick and simple. Um, again, formation is how, how they form really, really determines what kind of rock you become. And so if you have a, an existing rock, this is an important thing. You have to have a rock already in order to make a metamorphic rock. Something has to be there to metamorphose. So you need a rock first, whatever kind of rock, I don't care which. It can even be another metamorphic rock. All you need is heat and pressure. Those are the critical um, two ingredients. And once you get those, you can cause changes in that rock that will basically never be undone. And it will cause um, crystals or minerals within the rock to rearrange themselves. And that is called recrystallization. So they already are crystals or had some sort of crystal pattern in the first place, but you add the heat and the pressure, it kind of becomes not fluid. In other words, we're not melting it. Be careful with that. We're just making it really warm uh, without melting. And they kind of ooze or, 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 or kind of break down and reform into different things sometimes. It's very cool uh, how that process happens. And it takes a while, but it does, it does happen. And so, um, you can you can cause certain minerals to join together or you can cause them to become completely different minerals so that's a pretty interesting thing to have happen all right <clears throat> and you may be wondering well where do i get all this heat and pressure well we'll talk about that um, the process while these minerals are going through all that um, to uh, recrystallize and join together or change this is called foliation and typically the, the like minerals under such heat and pressure tend to collect together into these very, very thin, paper thin, little layers within the rock. And you'll see those, uh, especially if you turn the rock on its side. So again, I'll show, so show you some of those samples in the next um, portion. Uh, but we call that process foliation. And that is just a fancy name for minerals rearranging themselves and collecting together into these little um, crystal layers. And I said before, you know, this process overall takes forever, uh, but the longer it takes, the larger your crystals will be, just like in igneous rocks. So if you heat it up, but don't cool it down fast, you're gonna get some large crystals within that metamorphic rock, which is neat. They, they, they tend to look pretty cool. Um, if you cool down really fast, you're gonna get very dull, flat looking colors, no sh very little shine or uh, at least not, not much in the way of sparkly shine, uh, but you might see a little bit of a glare as we'll show you with slate. Um, so yeah, that's how that happens. And so I think I've got um, another link here. So I'm gonna quickly switch over to that screen. So we'll end and go to the pointer. I'm gonna click the link, open it up and show you in a nutshell, again, this is a five second, how do I get uh, metamorphic rocks to form? This, in this case, we're starting out with an igneous rock called diorite, which we'll talk a little about. <clears throat> Just basically, it's an even, Stephen mix of black and white crystals. Um, so there's feldspars, quartzes, and then some uh, amphiboles, and maybe some biotite in there. So you get um, kind of a, kind of almost like a Dalmatian looking rock here. And so what happens is we're gonna add tons of heat and pressure to that rock. And here's, here's the, uh, quick and easy animation of what happens when that goes on. So they're zooming in a little bit for you. They're showing you the heat, and then they're gonna show you the pressure, squeezing everything together, squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. And as it does so, the 
minerals, the black ones and the white ones will start to collect together into these little stripes and bands. And so what it looks like, the, so again, we'll do it, we'll play it again in just a second. The before is like, it was a random collection of black and white specks or speckles and that with sparkle actually, uh, which we'll talk about in the rock identification part. Uh, igneous rocks um, typically have a nice uh, sparkly pattern. Now we're kind of blending those crystals together where you get the stripes or the small layers of black ones and then the white ones and it almost alternates in certain cases. That again is the process of foli foliation as that happens. And in this case, they're saying you're gonna, gonna put a lot of heat and pressure on this one and you're gonna actually squeeze those so tightly you get um, slightly thicker layers of um, black and white. And that's called, the, ro the rock is called nice. It's uh, spelled G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, but it's pronounced nice. So that's, uh, let me play that again so you can see it. So again, you start out with a random black and white crystals all over the place, then they get squeezed with the heat and the pressure. Um, and the, the black ones uh, stretch out, white ones stretch out, they join together in certain cases and you get very thin crystal layers and that's foliation. So that is a very quick summary of how you form a metamorphic rock. So I'll switch back to the show here and then we will move on and be done. Um, so one of the key things you'll see with our metamorphic rocks, uh, some of the more boring ones, yeah, they're going to have, um, I'll go back. they're going to have um, maybe a slight glare to them, but the crystals are so small, they don't really do much. But as you start to increase those crystal sizes with large, longer cooling times, you might see a, um, some uh, platy crystals that really start to look like they're aligned where you start, instead of, um, just a glare, you're going to see almost a shiny glare rather than just uh, a slight white light coming off of it. Um, we'll look at that some more. A um, couple of quick, where do you get all the heat and pressure from? I guess that was a question I asked earlier. Well, here's uh, one big way. If you take two gigantic chunks of Earth's crust and slam them together, that's going to create a plenty of pressure. And eventually, uh, as that energy starts to release and um, come out of the, the situation, you're going to melt rock. So uh, that's where the metamorphism happens, and you can see that within the animation here. Um, so this happens over thousands and thousands of square miles, you know, wherever the edges of the plates are rubbing against each other or sliding past each other or slamming one goes under the other, you're going to create major, major um, heat and pressure. So whatever the rock is or was, it's going to change after the heat and the pressure gets applied. And, that's where we get large areas, like all mountains. If you've ever walked in a true mountain range, like the Rockies or the Himalayas or uh, the Andes, those are 100, almost 100% 100 metamorphic rock, except if uh, a piece of igneous or sedimentary gets um, driven up out from underground. But most, I mean, whatever you're walking is 98% metamorphic. So that's to be expected anytime you have mountain ranges. The other big source of heat pressure is what we call contact metamorphism. And this has to do with uh, a unique situation for reasons where we have magma that's kind of hanging out in an area underground now. Um, and all along the edge of the magma, now magma is melted. That is completely uh, too hot. That is, that's become lava or magma. So it is that whenever that cools off, that'll become igneous rock. And we would get an intrusive igneous rock. But look at the edges. This lighter orange shade that you see all around the edge, and I probably can point to that, like all that stuff right there, that's going to become what we call contact metamorphic rock because it was really, really close to that magma. So close that it got really hot and it has obviously lots of pressure on it already from being on the ground, but it didn't quite melt. And that can become metamorphic rock also. So same same concept, same thing. You're going to get foliation, recrystallization, all that business. But it's more of a localized thing. It doesn't happen over as big of an area as regional does. And the types of rock you get are usually kind of different because they're um, all in the ground like this. And still, very, you know, they're close to the lava and the magma. Um, so kind of an example of that. Um, what you've got here in this little picture is this stuff right here with all the little carrot shapes in it. That's called an igneous intrusion. That means that magma was trying to work its way up through from deep beneath the earth for whatever reason. Something happened, pressure ha was on and it moved its way up towards the surface. 
didn't looks like it doesn't quite make it. Um, it, it actually gets stopped by light, whatever layer D is here, which is actually shale. Um, so that's layer D that we're, uh, right along there. I'm kind of trying to highlight that and talk. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, and then layer B is uh, what we call sandstone, which is a sedimentary rock. A, the little brick shape, that's the universal symbol for limestone. Um, so we've got this igneous intrusion. It, it just does its thing, goes up through, and then, you know, probably stops the heat source, goes away. Whatever happens, happens. Now we have this, all this rock, and it cools down, and all of layer C becomes igneous rock, okay? So I'm going to switch the ink color here to a, let's go with uh, green. So here's the deal. Where you see these little tick marks, that got touched by this magma. And so all along here, where these tick marks are, that's going to be, a, a, you know, it's, it looks very small on, on this little screen, but this could be hundreds of feet thick. Uh, it's all contact metamorphic rock. Same here on the underside where it's in layer B there. That's all contact metamorphic rock. And it, it you know, was very close to something really, really hot, but it didn't quite melt. But everything recrystallized and underwent um, to some degree, some foliation possibly. So you get um, metamorphic rock. And it's all what we call contact metamorphic rock because it requires the contact with the magma or lava without actually melting. Uh, real quick, I think I'll go back to red here really fast because it shows up nice. If it, um, if it is sandstone, like in layer B here, sandstone, when it undergoes heat and pressure, so all this stuff right here and then all, you know, all the way to the edge of the screen, all that, that's going to become a rock we call quartzite. So the red would be quartzite. So if I were to have a, a better ability to write on this, you would, um, all that stuff would be, not all that, woo, I made a mistake, quite a mis mistake there, we don't want to go that far, do we? So not in layer A, that was the whole point. So really quick, I'll start over with that thought. Um, anything in layer B that got contact is that's all this red stuff, and that's all over here too, all of this. All right, so that would become quartzite. That's a metamorphic rock, forms by contact metamorphism. Uh, foliation, not so good with these, but um, there's still recrystallization that goes on. And then I'll change to, yeah, let's go blue. Let's see if how blue shows up. Down here in layer A, anything that was touching that magma, it used to be limestone, that's a sedimentary rock, but now, after it contacts and becomes heated up extremely by that magma, it becomes something called marble. So marble, uh, you may have some experience with that, and you might have seen marble tiles, things like that. That is definitely um, usually pretty awesome looking because it gets so twisted and distorted by uh, the, the, what was the limestone gets so twisted and distorted by the heat pressure, it causes all kinds of swirls and patterns and recrystallizations of different colors. So kind of neat stuff, um, really, really cool stuff. So that's a quick um, rundown on that. And then the, the other boring stuff, which we're not going to have to know the uh, name of, everything on top, let's go, let's go yellow, see how that turns out. Everything that's up here along layer D, that's going to be what we call horn cells. And that is a ugly, ugly, ugly rock. And, and that's what you get from contact metamorphism a lot of times with things like shale or mixed like dirt and other different kinds of rocks all together. It's just a random hodgepodge of things. Very difficult to identify. Not a very pretty rock either, but um, I, you won't be responsible for knowing uh, horn cells anyway. So to summarize uh, once more, we have a kind of a two decision, well, this, two, this is more of a flow type decision where the first thing you have to do is decide whether it's foliated or not. And the way to do that, you see paper thin crystal layers or bands of color within a rock, and that usually means foliation. Uh, if you see crystals, um, 
but you don't necessarily, they're all kind of uh, blended looking one or two colors, like say pink and whitish pink, very similar colors that are just kind of blurry as it says here. Uh, and you do see some sparkles. You'll see you'll see a, a lot of sparkles of that. That would be considered a um, non-filated rock. And the, the, then you're going to go off and make a grain size composition decision either way. Uh, but by knowing foliated and non-foliated, it really narrows it down quickly. And I'll show you how. Because if it's a foliated rock, you only have one, two, three, four options. If it's non-foliated, you have one, two, three, four, five options. And I can tell you for sure, meta-conglomerate, for example, it looks a lot like conglomerate, but it, everything gets squished and squeezed and, and kind of compressed down. And um, another thing about meta-conglomerate is you can cross it off because you won't see any in this particular lab. So that's that. You also won't see any Hornfels because it's too tricky to identify in the first go around when you're talking geology. So we are gonna not worry about that one either. So you're actually only, if, you're, if you decide it's non-foliated, you're actually down to only two possibilities or three, which is uh, quartzite and marble. Now, if it's black and non-foliated, it's gonna be a, a variety of coal called anthracite. And we will talk about um, particularly the three, uh, this, there's several rocks that appear from a distance to be black, but we want to look deeper and see, okay, well, which of these ones maybe has crystals in it or which one's shiny, which one's not. We're gonna talk all about that, but um, the metamorphic coal is called anthracite coal. So you really, by going foliated and non-foliated, you're very much narrowing stuff down quickly. Um, and then you only have to look at the grain size to make the decision on what, um, what you're seeing. So for example, um, if you see, this is a, the key point right here, the word banding. If you see alternating, like almost like a zebra rock, like it looks like black and white or maybe pink and gray stripes in it, um, you are looking at a rock called gneiss. And that's, that's because there's banding and the crystals are very large and all interconnected together. So that's what medium divorce means. If it's a smaller uh, crystal pattern where you're not quite there with the, the big uh, stripes, but you still see lots of shine and crystal uh, micro like uh, paper thin crystal layers, that might be this rock called schist. That's another fun one to say. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Um, for us in this class, uh, quartzite, um, quartzite will usually have a color to it. It'll be, it could even be green, but sometimes purple or uh, dark brown. Um, uh, sometimes it can be even a, uh, just gray. I mean, that's a possibility. So if it's marble, um, typically, and at least for our purposes, it's going to be, you're going to see sparkles, but they're all going to be white. White or uh, it'll, it'll look like uh, sugar almost sparkling. In, in, in under the light. So uh, we'll see that when we get to the actual identifications. So I'm going to talk a little about this at the end, but first in this slideshow, um, there's a whole bunch of different pictures of metamorphic rocks. So you can kind of just at your leisure, sift through those and look at what you might say. And the reason for that is because I think rocks like quartzite, this one, aren't uh, they don't stand out. It's tough to find uh, or, or go from, I don't know what this is to this is quartzite. So I wanted you to see some more pictures of it so you can sort of study up on that. And of course, then you have marble, which is a little easier to tell. The marble in our, our, our uh, lab will pretty much look like this. Um, but you also see that there's, there's some swirls in it of different color that can happen. But our marble will primarily be whitish and, and sparkly. Um, there's a meta conglomerate, which we won't see much of, but you can see everything looking squeezed and squished. Um, I need to talk about the rock cycle um, because it's just, it'll be on your lecture exam, I'm sure. Um, and you probably talked about it in lecture. Just, it's a quick way of, of understanding that, hey, any of the rocks that you have on earth right now could easily become another kind of rock if you put it through the correct processes that form these different three. So that's kind of the, the summary there. There's a uh, chart here that goes, that's in included on your rock identification charts within this, uh, this week's lab stuff. And it kind of shows you how it all could possibly happen. So if you want to become a sedimentary rock, for example, 
So that's this box right here. What do you need to have happen? Well, trace the arrows back as far as you can go, and you need sediment first, or some sort of uh, dissolved minerals. Um, and that can happen from weathering and erosion, no matter what. If you weather and erode things down, you're gonna get sediments, whether they're dissolved in water or whether they're actually physical pieces. Then you deposit them, you bury them, you squeeze them, and then you cement them together, you get sedimentary rock. That's how that happens. But you can break apart a sedimentary rock and do it all over again. You can heat and pressure a sedimentary rock to make it metamorphic. You can take a metamorphic rock and heat and pressure it again and make it even more metamorphic. Uh, you can melt any of these rocks, any, oops, that was uh, too far. Let me go back. Uh, let me screen share. Technical malfunction. Right to the end of the slideshow because I scrolled on the mouse. That's my bad. All right. So, uh, as I said, if you melt anything, you're going to get something that's called magma first. Oops. Went back too far. More technical malfunctions. Back to pen. All right. So, once you get magma, um, that can become an, a, only one kind of rock. I mean, you solidify that into igneous. So all of this stuff, in order to become an igneous rock, you get to melt it first, and then, then it becomes igneous as it cools off. But, you know, that's just kind of showing you, you can, you can go back and forth and become a different rock type just by those processes that you see along the arrows, and just use that to your advantage on any kinds of questions that you have. And, of course, the last um, kind of coup de gras on rocks and minerals as a whole is that they're useful and we use lots of rocks for different things and we use minerals, pure minerals for different things. Um, just bear in mind that a lot of them are non-renewable, especially the coals, which are our two fossil, one of the, some of the fossil fuels that we have available within the earth, they're non-renewable, so once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, we will see some of that in our ident identification portions. Um, ores, anytime you see the word ore, it's just your, your sample that contains something valuable it could be anything um, and you know just realize that yeah we're learning about this it's not necessarily the most exciting thing in the world but it, it is super um, important because we use them for so many different things so for example um, what is one igneous rock that you know of that is multicolor interlocking crystals so it's kind of has different colored speckles in it and it's um, usually nice and polished for you and you can actually have a lot of it in your kitchens or bathrooms and that would be granite and so again just kind of illustrating that you can use rocks for a lot of different things and granite is one of the very very um, sought after uh, igneous rocks these days as we continue to sprawl out and build lots of houses okay so here is the one slide that i really want you to i don't know you could print it separately or you could uh, kind of have it as a reference as you go forward and do practice or the lab test. Um, this is your dead giveaways. So if I have, uh, you know, let's say I got a rock and it's got bits and pieces of material cemented together. Well, sedimentary. If I see a fossil, sedimentary. Now, if I see something that looks kind of a, like a flat, dull, boring color that's fairly uniform, maybe a sparkle or two, but nothing crazy, that's probably a crystalline sedimentary rock. I'd say, I'd say these ones right here, in terms of rock samples, are the ugliest ones you can find. Um, just not very pretty at all. Uh, unless there's a fossil within that crystalline structure, but none of our samples are big enough to have both. So, all right. So, if you see large interlocking crystals of multi colors, like so pink and white and gray and black, and uh, sometimes there's even silver ones in there. Uh, you'll, and I don't mean it's silver, but they look silver in color. Those are, and they're big, like you can actually see, distinctly see them. Those are large interlocking crystals, and that would be an igneous rock. Smaller interlocking crystals, a little difficult, more difficult to see, but they're just little crystals that are also multicolored, different colors again, but they're just little. And that would also be an igneous rock. Interlocking, by the way, means they are stuck together. You cannot break them apart unless you hammer it to smithereens and even so you're not going to necessarily be able to uh, separate those out. If you see gas pockets in it or, or like holes where bubbles were, that is guaranteed igneous every time. That's your vesicular texture. Glassy, 
are the ones that look like chunks of glass um, uh, broken up. Uh, usually very ugly and um, uh, sharp edged. Um, so that's another good way to tell. Uh, last but not least, if you see minerals aligned in crystal layers, meaning it's a uh, little paper thin layers, or you actually see thicker layers of bands like uh, black and white or pink and gray stripes, that's going to be foliated metamorphic. Um, and I said banding when it's they're really thick. That's what I'm talking about. The non-foliated ones for your purposes. Uh, again, kind of look at some of the pictures down below in this slideshow. You're going to see a kind of a blend of two very very similar colors together. So like maybe some white and gray mixed together. Um, maybe some uh, pinkish uh, ones and some reddish ones blended together. There'll be sparkles in there uh, visible. No pattern though, it's, uh, you, but you're also gonna see way more sparkles in these than you would say in a crystalline sedimentary rock. So again, those are, this, this is the, you know, to me, if you're, as we go forward into trying to identify unknown samples, this slide is the bee's knees in terms of the dead giveaways that really can help you um, kind of hone in on first, which of the three types it is. So if, you know, if you're making decisions on rocks, you need first, in order to go to the right chart, which I'm giving you, you need to know whether it's sedimentary, igneous, or metamorphic first. So that's where this slide comes into play. And once you know that, you can go to the correct um, ID chart and use the specific, you know, language on the chart to actually figure out the name of the rock. So uh, that's all I've got for you. I know it was a long one. Uh, it's kind of me talking about all of rocks and, you know, however many minutes this is. So it is a lot. So uh, hopefully you paused it and took a break here or there. But the next phase of our, our investigation here for lab will be to actually look at some, say, unknown samples and use this and some of our charts to actually um, figure out what those minerals are. So that's where we're uh, headed with this, and we'll see you in the next video.